Politicians today are not held accountable in the way that they used to be, and they have tools to effectively shut down markets and control markets in ways that they didn't have before. So I'm worried about how extreme the behavior of central banks can be for the sake of effectively controlling markets. And they might shut down markets very easily if things don't go their way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I worry about the level of liquidity of markets and it's changing very, very quickly. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today Alan Dunn and I are joined by Nicole Collagian, founder and CIO of Quest Partners, and Mike Harris, who is the president of the firm, as part of our mini series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following and managed futures more broadly. First off, Nicole and Mike, it is great to have you both back on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. We've really been looking forward to our conversation. I hope you're both doing well. Great. Thanks, Niels. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Now, before we dive into all of the different topics that we're going to discuss, um, I would like maybe to set the stage for our conversation so that the audience knows a little bit of background to your firm. Uh, so perhaps I could ask Unigold to share a few highlights in terms of the type of strategies you focus on and also maybe where the business stands as we have entered 2023. Sure, Niels. Yeah, so the, build is, uh, the business is, uh, is basically, currently we're still trading futures and FX pri uh, primarily. We started trading uh, single stocks recently as well. Uh, we manage about 2.7 billion. With a, we're a short-term CTA, so our average days per trade is about eight, nine days per trade. Uh, there's about uh, 40 of us at this point. We're mainly New York-based. We've been around for 23 years. Um, we tend to focus on uh, strategies which are more positively convex, which means they benefit from vol expansions, not only from trends. Uh, and uh, that's quite valuable for hedge fund and equity portfolios. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and in fact, you were one of the first guests we had on the podcast back when it started in 2014. So uh, I have followed your uh, your success uh, very closely and and. Uh, congratulate you on on all of that now alan and i created kind of a list of topics that we thought would be interesting to uh, dive into as we go along and we'll kind of alternate in bringing them up but of course since we're the four of us in this conversation feel free to also uh, pick up anything that you want to um, bring up at the same time um, but alan as we normally do, why don't you kick off with the first uh, topic? <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, it'd be great to just get a sense on on the the investment philosophy of the firm, from the sense that obviously, as you say, you're focused on being a short term CTA with a uh, with a particular focus on strategies that are uh, attuned to, to kind of volatility expansion. So, I suppose wh why is that? What what is it about how the markets operate that you think that's a particularly unique area, uh, a unique kind of uh, source of alpha in markets? So, there, I mean, for us, it's an interesting topic, and <laughs> uh, let me explain. So, uh, since the 2008 crisis in particular, and even before that, since uh, uh, the 2001 cr uh, equity crisis, uh, central banks have been more and more uh, accommodating and basically providing liquidity into markets and what they've provided what they call the, the Fed put. Uh, what this has done is effectively encouraged people who are into selling volatility or people who are into buying the dips or people who are trying to benefit from selling insurance of one sort or another uh, to be more aggressive in their strategies. Effectively, they've, they've been protected from losses for a very, very long time. 
<clears throat> and what that has done is um, it's, it's created the market which is effectively even more mean reverting because of the success of those strategies. And that, that has created a certain pattern in markets where the volatility compresses abnormally much more than the fundamentals in a market warrant. And then it creates breakouts which are more aggressive. So we've done research that shows that the alpha of hedge funds, the alpha of CTAs, the sharp ratio uh, is all effectively to the 85% correlated to convexity. Effectively, the risk in the market is no longer volatility. Volatility is abnormally very, very low, but then the volatility itself has become extremely unpredictable. And so what we do is we're trying to benefit from the vol expansions as opposed to assuming that the volatility is constant. And uh, the fact that the, the alpha and the sharp ratio of hedge funds is coming from effectively shorting volatility, not really going along the market anymore, or at least the alpha is predicted by the amount of shorting volatility that a hedge fund does, uh, effectively they're shorting more volatility than they think they are. They're shorting it at prices which are below real uh, actuarial value. And uh, we've been able to generate, as a result, to generate uh, more returns uh, than the typical CTAs uh, while being more short the market on average. Uh, and this is uh, very, very attractive from a hedge fund uh, portfolio perspective. So the real risk is not fall, it's the tails. The tails can be measured through skew and convexity. The market is effectively selling the tails too cheaply because the central banks have effectively delayed uh, the corrections in the market cycle. And as a result, we're able to, even in a very strong, very liquid market, uh, create alpha uh, to, to hedge funds, create alpha to CTAs. So what we do is kind of specifically designed to be a better addition to, uh, uh, to a risk on top of portfolio than a typical CTA. Okay. And you touched on kind of the Fed post and how that has come into the market. Um, so do you see this as something, it sounds like a structural change, as you say, that the um, market participants are, are selling the, the tails too cheaply. Is that something you can identify when that started? And, and it, why is that likely to persist, even if you know, we're into a different kind of Fed environment now? Obviously, the Fed are trying to flex their anti and inflation uh, uh, muscles, uh, I guess. Um, and, and then the second question is, obviously, you're very focused on the kind of this volatility argument, but you express your positions in, in futures uh, as opposed to options. So why, why do you think that that's a better way to, to kind of capture these kind of volatility expansions and, and these mispricings? Yeah, um, great questions, by the way. So the, the policy of the Fed uh, is a byproduct of central banks becoming coming under more political influence. So effectively, the, the old classical uh, equity uh, recession or correction uh, is no longer accepted by politicians today. There's much more short-term thinking. Another reason for that is that the economy is today much more leveraged than it's ever been. So if you look at uh, the financial market's uh, size relative to the size of GDP, uh, it's at the highest ever. And so that's called the Buffett ratio. And the Buffett ratio effectively is a great measure of uh, stock, stock market value. Effectively, the markets at the end of the economy have become double the size of the actual economy. And this is, uh, they, they reached that high not long ago. Today, they're more closer to what, one and a half. Historically, that, that ratio is closer to 0.7. And the, the reason for this is more the fact that the, the Western economies are less competitive uh, being compared to the uh, emerging markets. Uh, and as a result, we're running at deficits, sub very substantial deficits. So central banks are having to intervene more. Uh, treasuries are having to print more money. Governments are running a deficit. Central banks are having to keep interest rates very low. And to do that, uh, you can't keep interest rates at uh, 1% while volatility is high, right? So uh, effectively, it's a whole chain of events, but the chain of events starts with the economy is becoming no longer competitive and politicians not uh, accepting uh, that going through a recession might be 
positive for the economy because it kind of encourages investors to look at uh, what are the real companies that are making money, what are the ones that are growing, as opposed to the Fed uh, providing liquidity the way it has does not allow for the market to be a fair uh, risk pricing mechanism anymore. Everybody makes money as a company. Uh, you're no longer, you don't have to have earnings. You can think of growth now in terms of uh, the value is completely disregarded. So all this is kind of like excesses that have come by the fact that the governments are trying to uh, delay recessions uh, due to short-term thinking. And as we do that, the economies are becoming weaker and weaker, weaker because we're not focusing on being more competitive. Uh, the Fed has just made it too easy to be a uh, uh, an economic or uh, a financial participant. So this is not something which is sustainable, of course, as you know. Um, historically, uh, everybody's tried to print money as a way to smooth out economic corrections and to make it look like the economy is growing when in real terms, inflation adjusted, it is not. What we've done at today has been, you know, the U.S. has been in a very, very privileged position due to the uh, global attraction to the U.S. dollar, we've been able to do this uh, more than ever before. So this has been assumed to be a, a, a structural change. The reality, if you look at history, it's never permanent. Uh, historically, the way this plays out is although money can be printed and financial markets can be controlled with uh, well-planned injections of capital, what cannot be, cannot be controlled is uh, physical commodities and what you see today is typically physical commodities are the ones that break the uh, kind of a control uh, regime of central banks. And typically it's seen by you know, other countries paying more for the commodities or uh, controlling the commodities. And effectively you get into real wars over commodities uh, as different empires, kind of let's say America versus China type of thing, fight for physical commodities which cannot be printed. So the financial market markets you can distort within a certain limited reality, but at the end, because you depend on the real economy, this is not sustainable and commodities is uh, pressure on commodity prices and uh, shortages in commodities become uh, more prevalent and eventually central banks have to match uh, the risks in physical commodities with the risk in financial markets and interest rates go up and TEs come down. That's normal cycle. In terms of your second question, why do we trade futures in terms of options? So you can create convexity by, you can be short volatility by buying the dips, or you can be long volatility by adding to winning positions, right? So uh, you can create nonlinear risk profiles, whether it's in correlation, whether it's in volatility, whether it's in market beta, by just by the way that you trade. Effectively, you can replicate the short option or long option. The way we, uh, the reason we choose to trade futures versus options is that futures are much cheaper to trade, much more liquid uh, than options, and uh, therefore we can trade faster and more accurately than we could with options, which are illiquid and are uh, more inefficient. Uh, we actually don't trade options. So first, with the trading, you can create gamma profiles or skews or convexity. Um, second, futures themselves, although they're called Delta One instruments, those are still markets which have a lot of convexity. If you look at com physical commodities in particular, where you can have shortages uh, in, in the short term, uh, you have, like, let's say you look at a net gas. Net gas, if you hold uh, the short uh, positions in you know, January, February net gas, uh, your yield is about 20% if you look at the, the you know, effectively the cost of parity. Now, that's not for free. That's effectively you're short an option. And in case there's a shortage, there's just no way to meet the, uh, to meet the, the demand and prices can double and triple. So Delta One instruments have embedded convexity in them as well. And we measure that, we measure the convexity that is embedded in markets, as well as the ones that we can create through our trading, as well as the one that other market participants are creating by effectively replicating short puts on the market in order to generate alpha in this environment. 
You know, I wanted to ask uh, Mike something about something that both is kind of a general observation from your decades involved in in the industry, and then maybe we can turn it also specifically to uh, to uh, your approach at Quest, and that is. Um, so Cliff Asnes came out with this paper uh, last year, and he talked about the dual mandate of uh, trend followers or CTAs uh, in terms of absolute returns and um, in terms of quote unquote crisis alpha. But then he also raised the question: you know, have we as an industry become too focused on shop? And um, so, I, first, I would love to hear your general view on the industry whether whether there is a point there that maybe we are giving up some of our, or maybe the industry has given up on some of the kind of true traits of, of say, trend following in, in this respect, because people or investors find it too hard to hold on to if it's too pure in pursuit of of a higher shop that makes it more palatable for for investors. And of course, the, the argument is a little bit about are we focusing on the line item shop or are we focusing on the portfolio shop? Uh, in terms of the benefit. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, Mike. Yeah, so I think first off, what's been really interesting, and you're right, I mean, I'm one of the few probably CTA market participants that's that's been doing this since my the very beginning of my career, both as an allocator and, and now at several managers. But I've really seen this evolution of strategies where in the early days, many CTAs um, had their niche, right? They were like Quest, a short-term manager, or they were a pure trend follower. Um, along the way, we started to add people who were trading more systematic macro. And then, as Nagal alluded to, we've started trading cash equities in recent years in more of a market-neutral stat arb fashion. And there's certainly a number of players doing that as well. And and because you know my first role was as a, a you know building fund of funds. You had these allocators and fund of funds and other portfolio managers that were putting together the the building blocks, if you will, to create uh, a really interesting, you know, CTA portfolio that would have elements of absolute return and then certainly that that tail risk protection that CTAs have historically been able to deliver. I think what you've seen over the last twenty to thirty years is that. Um, some of the larger CTAs have kind of morphed and become multi-strats in that sense that they're doing all of these various sub-strategies and blending them together. And as they did that, I think they were, in many cases, pursuing both of those goals that you referenced. The let's have the highest sharp possible to be able to kind of keep up with the other investments in the portfolio. But oh, by the way, we can't forget that most investors are allocating to us for years like 2022 when when everything else doesn't work and we need that true hedge in the portfolio. And if I could be so bold, I, I think that some managers may have lost their way. Um, we had such a long period of time uh, between crisis years that uh, in order to to retain their allocation, I think a lot of people became a little too focused on absolute return and and building the sharp ratio. And I think that one of the reasons you saw that evolution of the of multi-strat type portfolios is that the more orthogonal alpha you can add to a portfolio, theoretically, the, the higher your sharp goes. Uh, one of the things that I was really excited about when I joined Quest last year um, was that I don't think that we're in any way confused about the prioritization of providing that tail risk protection, albeit it's not to say that we're not focused on absolute returns. Um, that's an element uh, of what we do. Um, but I do think that, you know, that there may be some managers out there that um, whether it's, you know, looking at longer term look, you know, time horizons and holding positions longer, um, whether it's adding in strategies like mean reversion, right? I mean, you think about it when a, the market sells off aggressively. If you take 2020 when the pandemic first set in in March as an example, you have so many managers running mean reversion where when the market sells off, those mean reverting strategies are trying to buy the dip. And for a pure kind of short-term breakout player like we are trading just momentum, Obviously, our strategies are going to get very short in that moment. And, and that's what investors, whether we're their only CTA or whether we are their short-term CTA, 
They expect us to be that first mover in the portfolio, the, the thing that helps to start hedging their risk uh, right out of the gate. And when you're running mean reversion and you're loading up and buying in that dip, all you're doing is adding to a, a large portion of risk that already exists in their portfolio, whether it's from long-only equities or let's let's face it, outside of this CTA and macro world, so many traditional hedge fund strategies um, have a high degree of correlation to the rest of the portfolio. And so when that tail risk moment happens, I think investors underestimate how much risk they have. And you can imagine if your CTA is adding to that risk instead of helping you diversify away from it, that can be a very surprising outcome. Yeah, you you bring up a lot of good points, Mike. And um, I want to bring the gold back uh, in a few moments, but I want to stay with you for a second longer. From recollection, you you obviously classified as a short-term uh, manager. There aren't that many successful short-term managers, certainly less than five, I would say, probably only two. But from memory, I seem to recall that there is an element of trend following in the mo model. There is also something you call trend crowding. Can you explain a little bit about what role that plays in the portfolio? And then I'll come back to Nicole and talk a little bit more about it in a, in a slightly different way. Sure. So you're right. We have momentum signals in the portfolio. I would categorize them as certainly faster than what I've experienced across the industry. And like every manager, we have our own secret sauce or spin on our approach to momentum. Um, you know, we start with an understanding just of momentum in general. We actually have um, kind of a trend beta approach in addition to our flagship that we call QTI. And one of the reasons that we're doing that, obviously, is to help educate the industry about, in some senses, how simple trend can be. But then it's also, we use it as an indicator um, to allow us to understand, maybe broadly speaking, where other managers in the space are. And your point about crowding is is super relevant because, you know, as a short-term manager, and I've learned a lot in, in recent months from Nagal about this as I've been able to get more into kind of our, our value adds, you know, we think about, it's not just the, the trades that you take. For us, I think the real differentiator is the trades that we don't take. And let, let me explain that. So, Anyone can go out on Amazon and buy a book on short-term breakouts, right? There's tons of them out there. And it's not that difficult. I mean, you, you could just, on any of the, the common trading platforms, you could just pull up Bollinger Bands and use that as a, a potential signal for breakouts. But I think what, what Quest has found in its research over the years is that it's those false breakouts uh, and the cost associated of not only getting into the trade and then realizing you're wrong and having to exit, um, they add up over time. And that's what ends up being that drag on performance of short-term managers. And thus the reason, as you alluded to, that many have come and gone over the years and there really aren't that many that have the length of track record that Quest does. And so I almost think of it as playing good defense is the key to our strategy. And so we're using a, a, a tremendous amount of what I would call or, or refer to as filters to help us figure out what trades to take and what trades to ignore. And one of those filters is, is crowding, right? So understanding what other market participants are doing, where are the crowded trades? Because obviously when they unwind, that's going to be a pretty strong signal. And so when you can marry that and you're seeing a breakout, and you know it's a crowded trade, and you know that obviously the market is probably going to go a little bit further than it would have normally, then that's probably a trade that you want to be in. So I appreciate that, Mike. So I wanted to ask you, Nicole, and, and I don't know if I understood it correctly, so so please correct me if I'm wrong. You, you mentioned that you started trading individual equity. So are you seeing the program evolve more to... Multi-strat is not the right word I'm looking for, but maybe it is because it does have several strategies. Now it may have more instruments, etc. But are you trying to say, well, we're going to stick all of our best ideas into one strategy. We're going to keep 
we, as much as we possibly can, the profile that people have gotten used to in terms of what it looks like, the way it reacts, but there will be more um, bells and whistles um, uh, beneath that. And and if if that's the case, and you now have a few more tools in your toolbox, how do you think about deciding how much to allocate to each of these tools in the process of delivering that? Thank, thanks, Neil. That's a, a lot of questions in one, but uh, let me try. <laughs> so first, uh, uh, let me address the carving from uh, multiple angles. The Starting with uh, the, the mention that it, the, the dimension that sharp might be a little bit uh, overemphasized. I'm going to say that sharp is distorting markets. The fact that people or investors are chasing sharp ratios is actually distorting markets. So sharp ratio, which is heavily dependent on volatility measures, substantially underestimates tail risk, doesn't account for tail risk. As a matter of fact, the holy, the holy grail of hedge fund valuation, which as I'm going to say is convexity, is predicted by sharp ratio as well as by skew. So if, suppose you don't know how to measure skew. Measure sharp ratio, and sharp ratio is about 50-60% correlated to skew. So effectively, you can predict the size of a loss in a hedge fund as a multiple of its volatility by its sharp ratio. The higher the sharp ratio, the bigger the drawdown as a multiple of volatility. So effectively, what investors are ch uh, are chasing, and they are chasing sharp ratio too much, they are relying on volatility too much, and they are relying on past returns too much, is effectively distorting price, distorting the returns of trading strategies. It's creating what we call crowding. Okay, so how does crowding come into play? Most investment managers tell their investors that they have no market impact, that they can handle much more assets than they currently have. That's possibly not totally true. It's possible that this is a convenient statement, but the reality that too many people are doing the same thing. So although uh, you're a $10 billion long-term trend follower and there's another you know, 10, 10 of you guys out there, it's possible that you're all doing the same thing and you're highly correlated to one-year price momentum similar to the large smart beta providers in the industry. So uh, crowding can easily happen. Our experience is that uh, markets are very crowded, which means the strategies which are transparent, that are heavily marketed by smart beta providers, substantially underperform strategies with similar timeframes and similar portfolio constructions. So there's a huge cost to investing even in a smart beta strategy if it's public and if it's heavily allocated to. What we do in crowding is create a matrix of trying to, a four-dimensional matrix where we're trying to predict where we can find cheap trends and where we can find cheap volatility. And what we do uh, to, to, to do that is we're mainly trying to replicate the decision-making processes of large allocators and of large PM platforms. So when you go to the millenniums and the, and the large PM platforms, they tell you that if you lose you know, half your volatility, you go into a drawdown, they're going to cut your allocation by 50%. You lose the full uh, volatility, you're actually deallocated 100%. And similar on the upside. Uh, you make half of, you know half your volatility. You allocate, you allocate more to you, 100% of your volatility. You get more money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So effectively, uh, the platforms, because they're trying to manage a huge amount of money, they don't have the time and the resources to analyze traders. They're quick to give you money, but they're also very quick to take the money away. The structures and the processes and the uh, the dynamics of that allocation and the allocation process is very, very useful in predicting future returns. So what are the four dimensions of crowding? We uh, measure crowding across first, which markets within a sector, if you want to be exposed to momentum uh, in fixed income, where is cheap momentum, right? As Mike said, 
you can expose your, you can uh, have 90% correlation to the index with positive alpha, just trading moving averages and being in the market 100% of the time. But in reality, is there a way to say that trend within fixed income is going to be better in bonds versus US treasuries? And crowding allows you to do that. So one dimension is you can choose which market within an asset class you should be trading. Second dimension is which asset, asset class should you be exposed to? Should you be exposed to more fixed income, a trend in fixed income, or a trend in commodities, or trend in FX, or trend in equities? That's the second dimension. Third dimension, which time frame is going to be more valuable? Is it going to be the very, very long term? Uh, one-year momentum, two-year momentum, three-year momentum, very long-term moving averages, or two, three-day trends. Third dimension is, the, is this time frame, right? So you can apply exactly the same models to different time frames. Um, and the fourth dimension is what type of trading strategy should you use? Should you use, should you use moving average crossovers, exponential moving average crossovers, price momentum uh, at an AQR? Channel breakouts, like the turtles, volatility breakouts, like the Toby Cradles. That's the fourth dimension. So there's different trading mechanisms or Bollinger Bands, for example. So one is which market within asset class. Second, which sector. Third, which time frame. And, and fourth, which momentum methodology should you be using? So if you look at a matrix of all these things, you can see what's a, how things are performing and you can predict what allocators are going to chase first. And second, you can pre predict what very intelligent, but not street smart researchers are going to optimize in their machine learning algorithms. So when we think of learning, when we think of research, we were think of there's retail thinking. You can basically retail thinking is, you know, 200 day versus 10 day single moving average crossover. That's kind of retail trend following. Then you have the smart beta providers who have kind of like diversified versions of that. And then you have smart hedge funds, you know, the, the, the big math brains and the machine learning and the, the quants and all the data and all that. Those guys are just typically optimizing over what has worked historically. Another order of thinking about that is what we try to do is to try to predict based on the current data, on the recent data, what are people going to optimize towards? Both researchers with their classical optimizing mechanisms as well as investors. So crowding is a way to predict not what the current market regime is and what is currently working, but based on what has worked, what is going to work in the future. So market is about supply and demand. Math is useful, but you cannot think with math. You can express with math, but thinking has to happen one level beyond the math, one level beyond the optimization. What is going to be the next market regime based on what is currently working now? Assuming that what is working now is going to continue to work is not correct. As a matter of fact, it's counterproductive, which is why if you interview 100 researchers with sharp ratios of 1, 2, and 3, and 5 these days, and you give them money, less than one out of a hundred will give you that type of sharp ratio in real life. Not because they've over-optimized, but because the market is going to chase those parameters and become a, kind of a, the strategy is going to experience a lot of slippage and more, more false signals in the future. So the uh, risk pricing of trading strategies is similar to the risk pricing of markets, supply demand. So what we do with crowding is actually try to address this as a source of alpha. Sorry for the long answer. And so just, just to clarify then the, 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 the question, because I think that's a great explanation, very interesting insight, uh, Nicole. So does that mean that you will have a dynamic allocation to various, let me just call it, type of momentum strategies in order to deliver the total profile that you want? And do you then consider the program kind of moving more into kind of a a, a multi-strat, but with that clear focus, so not really multi-strat the way a lot of people think about it? Yeah, so definitely that there's dynamic uh, allocation decisions to momentum across those four time frames, and they're very useful versus the smart beta strategy, 100%. In terms of how we're evolving, and you know we're at uh, we're often one percent of the volume in 
the big markets, U.S. Treasuries, energy, gold, uh, even foreign exchange. So, you know, even at uh, close to $3 billion, because of our short-term uh, nature of our credit, we're close to capacity. So what are we doing to expand our capacity? We're not going towards multi-strat the way other people have done it. So effectively, if you take strategies which are negatively skewed and at low volatility have zero correlation, as you know, as volume expands, typically the strategies that are negatively skewed correlation is, to each other is going to increase when markets go down. At that, you know, just, just quickly, a negative skew gives you a lot of alpha, gives you a lot of sharp ratio, gives you typically low correlation, uh, gives you low correlation to the S&P and to other uh, assets. But it also predicts large drawdowns as a multiple of uh, volatility. And it predicts that you're going to lose money quite substantially when the market is going down, although it, the risk statistics told you that you weren't. So multi-strat is typically a thing which is uh, taking a bunch of uh, negative dispute strategies, which at low volatility have low correlation and putting them together to achieve something quite incredible, which is historically hasn't been achieved, right? Now, the danger of these things is that uh, as tails happen less often, but they're bigger than they used to be, there's a tremendous risk to the those large multi-strat strategies. So even though the COVID crisis, some of the best funds with best sharp ratios were close to getting wiped out if it wasn't for Fed interventions, similar in 2008, similar in 2001. So the way we're diversifying, we're trying to take the same equity curves that these multi-strats are trading, but we're trying to generate positive skew out of them. So we're trying to time in and out of them in the periods where there's positive convexity. Effectively, we don't want returns with negative skew. We want returns and sharp ratio. It won't be as high as the multi-strats, but it will be most importantly with positive skew, which means when the economy kind of goes towards the real world, which is effectively China and the US fighting over physical commodities, and volatility becomes more in line with the fundamentals and the volatility. And we want to be able to make more money, not less. So we want a program which is stable over decades, not only over the short term. So we're building a portfolio with the multi-strat. We want to be exposed to as many sources of alpha as possible, or we want to do it with a positive skew angle. So it's quite different how the portfolio ends up being built. Yeah, maybe just to pick up on that a bit more, so just so I understand, um, <clears throat> what the, the concept of crowding, you know, it, it often is applied to kind of positions to avoid, you know, this trade is a crowded trade. But are you looking also trying to pick up on where these multi-strats are, are you know, what, what, what types of trades are, have been successful and are likely to attract capital and then participate in those, um, as well as identifying trades that are, excessively crowded? Is it kind of crowding in and crowd, uh, and getting out before the crowd the crowd kind of gets out of the trade? Absolutely. But in this case, I don't know, we're not timing which trade. We're not deciding which market is crowded. What are the positions of hedge funds in a specific uh, security or futures market? That's not what we're doing. We're actually timing the entry and exit into the equity curves of the different strategies that multi-strats use. So we're not selecting specific trades, but we're saying, for example, in this environment, you should be trading channel breakouts, not moving averages, or you should be trading um, more long vol rather than classical beta one trend following. So it's more the nuances within active strategies rather than individual trades. So we're saying expose yourself to very short-term trend following in fixed income and expose yourself to very long-term trend following in dollar yen because of the way these things have performed relative to each other. And this this is kind of a very adaptive approach and it's kind of like speaking to a lot of managers, everybody is, is kind of highlighting the benefit of being adaptive. How, like in your experience, how long, how persistent are these environments do you find? That if, if it tends to be good to be trading buns relatively fast or whatever, does that last for weeks or is it more days? Or, 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 or is the portfolio constantly changing, you know, how it trades in different markets? So 
this type of uh, factor, which is used as a filter to decide when to trade momentum, is valid in all time frames. The more short term you go, the more powerful it becomes. The more uh, market participants are likely to create market impact by on one side trading ahead of them, on another side providing liquidity to them when they overdo uh, the trading or they become desperate for liquidity, short term you're going to have more market impact. So we try to apply that in all time frames, not the all the long term. As a, as a matter of fact, as the firm has grown, we've actually gone more short term rather than uh, dilute what we do by becoming more long term to reduce market impact. So. Uh, the firm has recently invested in you know a couple of hires from high frequency firms, where we are very carefully learning how to test the market. So it's not a question of uh, theoretically or academically having a formula that predicts market impact. It's a question that we're trading already. We're one percent of volumes of these the biggest markets in the world, and how is the market responding to what we do? How can we signal to the market? that there's a large player in the market and how can we hide that there's a large player uh, trading in the market. So we, we're trading anyway, so we're not paying transaction costs. We're already pay we, the transaction costs are already a sunk cost. So there's a lot of things you can do in the way you execute to, to become more price sensitive, which CTAs are not. There's no relative value concept used in, I'm going to say in most CTAs based on my interviewing you know, researchers and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So we're saying the go as short term as possible. The more short term you go, the more diversification potential you have, the more quirks you can find, the more complexity see, it takes and the more skill it takes as well. But we're not afraid of that, right? So there's a lot to be done, basically. Yeah, it sounds very look like a, a, like an adaptive learning technique. Uh, you haven't used the term machine learning at all. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you see it as machine learning or, or, or a, a form of learning or...? or how, how would you characterize it? Machine, machine learning is not a black and white. I mean, uh, any type of optimization, I think that going from the, of the type of optimizations that we used to do 20 years ago in TradeStation uh, versus the uh, all the more complex uh, different learning methodologies that are available today is a gray line. Mathematical optimization is a commodity. You can buy it for free. The understanding of what you're doing, even in a static environment, is something which is a commodity. Costs almost nothing to hire the best, you know, some of the best machine learning uh, experts. What's hard to understand is the impact on the market of what the market is learning. So we're spending, so I don't mention machine learning because I don't spend time thinking about it. What the market provides as a commodity is already. Uh, overkill compared to the type of optimization that financial markets allow you to make without artificially convincing yourself of things that are highly, highly unstable. So conviction, when it comes with a lot of data, is actually problematic in financial markets because of supply-demand equations. You're not measuring consumer behavior. You're measuring something that the day you measure it, it's going to flip on you because other people measured it and allocated it to the same thing that you saw, to the same factor that you saw. So machine learning is there, but I'm not proud of it. I don't think it's a sign of superiority. I think it's a sign of danger that you're fooling yourself to believe something uh, out of data in a, uh, in a particular um, environment, which is highly unstable and susceptible to false confidence due to a lot of data giving you a sense of stability when it's exactly the opposite. So the fact that we we're focusing on tail as a measure of risk as opposed to volatility will eliminate the type of 90% of the optimizations that super smart researchers will typically do, All right? So machine learning is not like this achievement. It's, I would say, a commodity. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, thinking about research and, and the types of strategies that, that you've come up with and, and, and the whole research approach, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, TradeStation 20 years ago and to, to where we are now. I mean, what, what, what has been the big... Um, but, or what's currently the big source of opportunity for you? Do, do you find, is it more data sets or alternative data or better computing power or getting be able to trade faster? Or, or wh wh where do you see as being the, the source of 
that that gives you opportunities as you as you look ahead with the advent of more better optimization tools the sharp ratio that investors are achieving is not getting higher so that's not thing this is like we're getting technologically better and we can do things that we couldn't do before you're still limited by the supply demand and risk equation of money which is real world this is not something theoretical okay so how you can compound your money and the risk of blowing up are the real world so the way we're expanding is we're taking historically we uh, so we are doing everything that we can do so alternative data sets new markets but more importantly we're doing the things that other people are not doing so i would say that there's too much focus today on delta 1 markets so you could trade 20 day channel breakouts and be quite crowded right but as a matter of fact you know some strategies are so crowded that you're better off shorting them long term than big long term so you want to add value do what you're doing but also short the crowded trend following strategies such as the 20 day channel breakout so what we do for example is instead of trading based on price breakouts which are very crowded you can take something which is correlated to the market that you're trading such as cpi gdp growth unemployment for example and use those factors so illiquid uh, indicators to trade liquid markets so liquid markets so why is it so hard to trade the s&p using momentum strategies like last year the s&p was down uh, 18 or 17% it was very hard for long term trend followers to make money on on equities so the type of noise that markets start to generate when too many people are trading the same way becomes very counterproductive to returns although there are big moves similar thing to you know energy is in the past years you know when people start making money they allocate a lot of money to trend following in a sector then the trends become very noisy so uh, markets you want to trade things entering and exiting at times that other people are not you can take a market and remove a principal component of trend following off it to create diverse entry points so remove the basket of trend following positions use that as your index remove it from dollar yen and then trade that differential because that differential will be much more diversified than other what other market participants do right so i'm not saying trade a purely you know a neutral sp- a spread but remove some of the volatility let's say remove 20% of the volatility of dollar yen by using a basket of trend following or instead of trading dollar yen trade uh, use like a trade balance indicator to trade dollar yen so that's another way of diversifying your entries third you can trade the relative value to dollar yen you can start using you know fundamentals in a way which is positively skewed to trade dollar yen so there's all these different approaches to create a uncorrelated return stream so you think of macro investors they're not trading breakouts only they correlate to trends but they're using a bunch of uncorrelated indicators which are correlated to the liquid markets to trade the liquid markets so they end up creating you know generating higher sharp ratios than the typical city is so those are the ways we're expanding what we do yeah i want to go in a slightly different direction with you mike because back when i started in this industry in the 80s there was a, a d word that when that came up people were really frightened and it was derivatives in our industry there's another d word it's discretion and i wanted to ask you based on the fact that you've obviously been uh, in the industry for a long time but you've also covered a lot of different roles in the on the manager side and uh, we had someone write in to us uh, as we were releasing the first uh, episodes of this series asking whether we could bring up the use or not use of discretion so maybe i can just throw it out there to you and and ask you uh, you know how much discretion is too much and then you can run with it from there yeah i i would agree that um that d- the 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 d word of discretion comes up in a lot of conversations particularly with investors and i think the reason is because you know 10 20 years ago there seemed to be really two crowds there were the pure 
uh, traditional fundamental discretionary uh, investors and traders who at that time was probably the majority. And then you had this small pocket of, of quants in our world who, you know, we had to pound the table to reinforce the notion that we are, in fact, 100 percent systematic in everything that we do. And, and if we're not, the minute that we stray from that, how can you ever believe a back test? How can you ever look at a, a, a track record of returns over 10, 20 years and believe that we will produce something similar in the future, right? I mean, just the very notion of uh, turnover and succession plans. I mean, look at, it's one of the things that I'm most uh, proud of in, in our industry is that there are quant fir firms out there that have been around like Quest 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, some approaching 50 years. And that's not the same person running those firms. But in many cases, it's the same family of models that are being used. And if we were a discretionary shop or a discretionary industry, when that person that has that secret sauce in their brain decides you know, to hang up their cleats and, and retire from the industry, in many cases, those firms uh, either close or people take their money, you know, they get deallocated from as a result. What's really interesting, I think, in recent years is this term quantumental. So there are so many people, particularly, I think, coming more from the fundamental and discretionary side that have realized the, the power and the importance of data. And as a result, our industry, the cost that we pay for said data has gone up exponentially for a lot of reasons. You know, number one, because there are more people using it. And, and more people seeing, seeing the, uh, the value of it. Number two, because many of the people who had data that we were using if either cheaply or for free realized the, you know, the value of that data and started monetizing it, right? We, we're, we're not here to get into a discussion about exchanges and how they've become for-profit entities and how they've been raising data costs, obviously, exponentially over the years. But that term quantumental, I think, in large part comes from the fact that, and, and this you know, may have come from several places, but I, start, I saw it start to pop up really in the traditionary global macro discretionary shops where they would hire PMs, and that PM may bring a quant onto the team and a data scientist, and they would create models, and then those models would throw off signals that then the PM could then use their discretion on. Yes, this fits, fits with my macro view. I'm going to go put that trade on. But they would, in many cases, decide how to size it, decide how long to hold, when to exit, um, which all of those things are the opposite of what systematic traders do. And I think that in many cases, um, some of those quantumental investors have had success. And so now, instead of just having quant and discretionary, we have three, you know, three separate camps. And... I'm seeing it just as, you know, we're interviewing uh, a ton of researchers and portfolio managers and so many people that come and when I look at the resume, look like a pure systematic quant, when they walk me through their model or how they've built models in the past at other shops, um, there is a good amount of discretion that's happening. And, um, you know, that that's an approach. I think some people are having success with it, but that's that's not kind of the the system that we've built at Quest. No, I, th I think that's that that that's great to um, to get that view. The next question I had is um, I'll start with you, Mike, but I, I think also Nicole might uh, have something to say about it. And just to spend a little bit of time on it, not too much. Um, it's this thing about CTA replication. Now, of course, as as you've mentioned, Quest has for many years had its own replication model, and of course, it's it's a real model, so to speak. It it has models that generates the the signals etc cetera, etc cetera. now we have this new breed of replication where they uh, do some kind of regression uh, looking at daily returns of the uh, index of the largest uh, managers to essentially guess what exposures they have on and then they try to mimic that etc cetera, etc cetera. i wanted to ask you mike from your point of view what do you think what do you think about replication in, in general. And I'd love to ask maybe uh, Nicole from a more quant point of view, what are the risks that, that you could see uh, when using this type of regression analysis rather than actual models to do replication? Um, because that's way above my math grade. 
Um, so, Mike, Mike, what, what, what in general, what, what do you think about CTA replication? Uh, knowing full well that you have a program like that, but of course, um, that was there before you joined. <laughs> so, when I started in the '90s, allocating to CTAs, um, we had many trend followers in my portfolio, and we were paying two and twenty um, for for that exposure. Fast forward 20, 30 years later, and now we have this term cheap trend because many managers realize that um, with the longer term look backs in particular, they could manage billions upon billions of assets. Uh, and there was a real scale to it because it was already running. It was auto already automated. So they could then start to offer it at a lower price. The first thing that disappeared, and um, one can make the case that by selling uh, trend to kind of the retail community and doing and packaging that, that up in many cases via 40 act vehicle, the first thing that disappeared was the performance fee for regulatory reasons. And then what we saw over the last 10 years is some of the larger, particularly public pension funds have gotten into the space is that even the management fee started to come down as managers were competing with each other in order to try to win those, those very, very large, in some cases, multi-billion dollar tickets. And what's really interesting is alongside what I've also witnessed on the investor side, some of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, even some of the world's largest family offices have now also moved into the space of forget getting trend from, for cheap from a manager. I'm just going to go out and hire professionals from the industry to build it for for us and we'll run it ourselves at an even lower cost. Now, what's interesting about that is I've seen a number of them actually kind of decide not to do that after a period of time. And I think in large part that was because of the operational nature of running a CTA, the fact that you're trading 24 hours a day, the fact that data doesn't always come in clean, that there's a lot of work behind the scenes in order to keep that trend following engine running. And so it's it's interesting that that we've gone on this on this path, and yet I think people still see the value in employing professional managers who can take the basics of momentum and then put their unique spin on it to create a return stream that maybe they either a can't replicate or b can't run themselves. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, Nicole, in terms of the math in all of this. What's the risk that people may not be aware of when you start replicating managers by just trying to do some kind of analysis, regression analysis based on daily data, but without actually, I guess, having a real kind of model risk management framework around it? So the longer term the manager is in his trading strategy, uh, the more confident that you can be that your math is going to be accurate and replicating him. I would say that the math is very powerful in replicating long-term measures. So I would say that the risk is minimal. The more short-term you go, the more filtering there is, the harder it becomes to replicate. So if you're doing, uh, I don't know, if you're doing five-day channel breakouts, or, uh, for example, but you're doing it under certain conditions that kick in and out three, four times a year, you can replicate the five-day channel breakout, but you, it's harder to know when a new condition kicked in. Uh, with long-term managers, you don't have that risk as much, so the math is very, very accurate. Uh, in today's world, also, you can interpolate, right? So you can create your own replicators and then uh, create something. Your replicators can be close enough to the manager, and then you can analyze a lot of other things based on the very high-frequency uh, high data that your own replicator is giving you off the manager replication. So you might have monthly returns for a manager, but then off your replication, you can get daily returns and then you can learn over time, uh, you know, uh, things as well. So let's say the math, the, the math wise, the risk is very low, very, very accurate. For me, the risk of the smart beta stuff is not in the math. The risk, the risk is in the, in allocating to large cap versus small cap. It's, it's the risk of allocating to the S and P 500 relative to small cap. Why do small caps outperform the S and P 500? because too many people are investing in the S&P 500. Same thing in the CTA space. I would say that hiring uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, you know, having the monkeys select stock randomly is better than investing in the S&P 500. OK, 
Okay. So it's the same thing in the CTA space. Small cap is better than large cap. And random, random is not better than the replicator, but random also means it's small and that's valuable. So uh, investing in replicators is very dangerous. You can replicate the large manager and have transparent models and see the specific slippage increase as the assets increase in the replicator. And then the slippage come down when the assets go back down very, very precisely. Alan, before you jump in, I just want to follow up with one question because you kind of already alluded to it. You talk about small cap, large cap in the manager space. Uh, we've talked about um, capacity. Uh, you are in the shorter term space. I think a few years ago, I saw you kind of make reference to um, the dangers of becoming too big when you are a short term manager. Where do you think it's realistic to go to as a short term manager nowadays, given the instruments we can trade, the liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. How are you thinking about uh, that? And uh, and obviously you mentioned it earlier today that you know, single stocks would, is one way for you to expand the capacity, but is there a limit out there that you, that you already think about where you say, yeah, if we're going to keep our profile, we want to have this average duration of our trades. This is kind of where we probably will have to um, close or soft close. So... I think in terms of maintaining the quality of what we do and taking the next small step, I don't have a goal for the firm in terms of asset size. Let me give you a, a better answer, which comes from somebody who is much smarter than I am, who runs a very, very large firm. And he says that he always laughs at allocators who ask him, like, what is your capacity? He says, I can go and buy every hedge fund out there. My capacity is infinite. So capacity really is is infinite from that perspective. But for us as a firm, we're taking, you know, based on our resources and our capabilities and uh, the depth of our management, we're trying to enter new areas with a very, very strict filter, which is we want returns which are positively skewed. Size is not a goal. So I can, I never, I don't think much about your question specifically, but I think definitely there's a lot of leeway uh, based on the resources that we have today to, to create capacity slowly you know, it's not a speed the speed of the growth of the assets is attractive to a business but it's not shouldn't be that attractive because it creates long-term instability that's how long it i think of i just wanted to pick up on a couple of points raised um uh, you know you mentioned liquidity you mentioned platforms uh you touched on kind of uh, March 2020, the system, you know, reached a, a, a breaking point, really. Uh, and then I, I guess what, what we're seeing is maybe a difference, an evolution in the market microstructure in terms of the participants and, and the size of assets uh, being held. So, I mean, what's your thoughts on maybe firstly on liquidity as a short term manager? You know, is it as is there are, are there issues there from your perspective or is are the market still deep enough? Uh, and then secondly, you know, that change ongoing change in, in the market uh, microstructure um, is that I, I, I guess you're attuned to that and with the, the crowding and, and, and the opportunities that that might be evol uh, developing. But are, are there other ones like uh, we're hearing a lot at the moment, you know, more use of uh, zero days to expiry options, things like that, more retail participation in the options markets. Are they sources of alpha that you're trying to, to, to capture? Um, <clears throat> we're not trying to uh, use options. As a matter of fact, we don't use implied volatility data whatsoever in all of our models, although we're very convexity focused because the delta on the markets have more precise and more short-term information than options. I'm getting more the, the impact of those participants on the on the the future, the delta one, the futures markets, um, if 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 at all. You know, it's harder to isolate on the, in the future market the the you know, the effect of the retail participants relative to what the citadels provide hedge funds uh, in terms of the way retail is trading, right? So um, we really haven't focused on that much, actually. Yeah. And then the liquidity conditions more generally? So, oof, uh, so liquidity, 
think of it this way, the, the high frequency firms are generating that the ones that are successful are so profitable, are generating so much cash that they're able to get much smarter very, very quickly compared to the typical hedge fund. As a result, the intelligence that they have and the dynamism in their pricing of markets is way more advanced than a typical hedge fund can handle. So what I'm saying is effectively liquidity is much more dynamic than it used to be when it was the banks providing, making markets. So these high frequency firms can provide liquidity when nothing is going on, and then they can completely pull the liquidity out of the market when things are not going well for them. What that does is creates more convexity. Effectively, it creates a false sense of security for the large managers to think that you have liquidity and it will be there when you need it. The reality is that the liquidity is drying up very quickly when markets are going down, much more than before. And within that, there's much more intelligence, which means the intermediate term size hedge fund or the large hedge fund is more easily picked up by these high frequency firms because it's very hard to hide uh, your market impact as size grows compared to the short. So you're getting worse and worse as you grow by definition, because it's, you're, you're harder to hide as the elephant in the room. And the small guys are so profitable that they can get very, very smart quite quickly and be very, very adaptive. So I would say it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, the, the profits of the high frequency firms and of the market makers is not visible to the large guys. But, you know, we're in touch with some and it's quite impressive what they're able to achieve, not, all, not only in terms of sharp ratios, but in terms of the net dollar sales of gains. And so all that, this tells you liquidity is very dynamic and unpredictable and more and more so in ways that are very harmful to market participants. And, and if I could just add, <clears throat> Nagal mentioned earlier that we have recently hired some experts in the high frequency trading space. And it's been it only, just in the first few months, it's been eye opening. Um, you know, the first thing that, that occurred to me when I started interviewing a lot of these folks is that there's two camps in the HFT world, right? There's those who, um, and there's only a handful that have made so much in, in recent years that they've been able to reinvest in the business in a, in a way where effectively it's hard for anyone to compete with them. They are, they are effectively playing that arms race that you hear about and you read about. And then there's a whole secondary group of high frequency traders who have almost waved the, the technology white flag and said, I can't compete with you on speed but I'm gonna compete with you on my understanding of the market microstructure. And these are the people that we've just hired where their understanding of the participants in the market and how everyone is signaling their intentions in the market um, in, a, in a way that can be picked up from a pattern standpoint um, is not only helping us to think about how we execute our order flow and how we make sure that we don't walk into any of those bear traps uh, that, that maybe are being set for us in the marketplace, but also with a greater understanding of the market microstructure and how markets are moving, kind of this idea of next tick prediction. You know, when you're a market maker, you, you're always trying to figure out how to skew your price so that you're not the person that gets adversely selected. And so they develop these very, very fast short-term alphas that tell them, we think the next tick is up, we think it's down, or we think it's neutral, uh, enables them to stay ahead of the, of the general market. And as I said, this is not only helping us to think about smarter ways to execute, but also can be fed back into some of our models to help us think about, you know, we're not trading maybe sub-second like they are, we're, we're holding, as Nagal said, for a couple of days, but thinking about as markets are breaking out, what are the additional signals that can come from that market microstructure that can help once again filter out the good the good breakouts from the bad ones? Great stuff. Now let me round off with a question that we normally ask, but since you're two two of you, I have to come up with two questions, but they will be very similar. And so you're going to get the heads up here, Nicole, because I'm going to start with Mike. So what I'm going to and I'll give you ten seconds to think about this, Mike, while I confirm what Nicole will then be asked. But I'd love to hear from you, Mike. 
what's the one thing you hear about trend following that you disagree with the most? And then I'll turn to you, Nicole, and ask, what's the one thing you hear about short-term trading that you disagree with the most? So, <laughs> Well, I've already alluded to it, but I'll maybe go into a little bit more detail, which is I hear that trend following is easy. And yes, there are many books out there written about it. There are very simple ways. Um, you know, you can, on a Bloomberg terminal, it takes you about two seconds to pull uh, a short-term and a long-term moving average and, and to see where they cross, right? But there is so much work, and I've you know, spent 25 years of my life trying to get into the minutia of the quality of the data, the types of strategies you're using, the people that you hire and having a, a differentiated kind of group of, of thinkers so that you're, you're not getting kind of industry group think, the way that you execute those orders, the time horizons you embrace, the markets that you put into the portfolio. We, we didn't talk about it today, but you know, alternative market CTAs has been a phenomenon in recent years. And as Nagal alluded to, we're starting to add new markets to the portfolio. Um, and I, in a sense, we can thank those alt CTAs, uh, alt market CTAs for creating more liquidity in those markets because as a short-term trader, it would have been more difficult to, to be a first mover in that space. Um, we're even doing research on crowding in some of those alternative markets, and that might be uh, an interesting path for us to go down. But, you know, I, and I've only teased out a handful of, of some of the things that you have to be focused on, but as I alluded to, Many people have tried to either start a CTA or to replicate a CTA, and I think that they get far enough down the path that they realize that it's way more complex than uh, most people give it credit. I couldn't agree more. Nicole, um, what are your thoughts about things that you hear people talk about when they talk about short-term trading that you really disagree with? And, and it, you can't say the same answer because the same answer could apply but you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> no, no, I won't give the same answer. No worry. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, by the way. Listen, the, the, the thing that I hear the most about uh, short-term CTAs is that they're less reliable and harder to understand than long-term CTAs. And therefore, as you see, they're very, very substantially underrepresented in hedge fund portfolios and in CTAs portfolios. That's not my experience. I think that being short-term gives, gives you if done with the right discipline and uh, with the right uh, intellectual integrity, it's a much more reliable approach than long-term CTAs. I think long-term CTAs have become unpredictable due to the skew of the market and their models are not fast enough to be able to adjust to the volatility changes that we're experiencing in the world today. So I'd say that, that short-term uh, short CTAs are more reliable more valuable than the long-term ones by far. Okay, very interesting. Um, the final question I'll give to you, Nicole, and that's just when you look into 2023, um, what are you most excited about? Or And is there anything that you kind of concerned about when you look at whatever you, wherever you want to go? Well, uh, the excitement is that the 20-year regime where central banks could print money and effectively governments could overspend without any impact on inflation, that's gone. So I think we've entered the regime where physical commodity inflation is here. It's here to stay. And effectively, it means that we've met our match in the world in terms of people who are willing to pay for paid up for things. Inflation is very, very hard to reverse, okay? especially if you're running budget deficits the way we are. So I believe that inflation is here to stay and you know, that will bring up a lot of loyalty. That's what I'm excited about. What I'm worried about is uh, politicians today are not held accountable in the way that they used to be. And they're, they have tools to effectively shut down markets and control markets in ways that they didn't have before. So I'm worried about how extreme the behavior of central banks can be for the sake of effectively controlling markets. And they might shut down markets very easily if things don't go their way, et cetera, et cetera. So I worry about the level of liquidity of markets and it's changing very, very quickly. I think those are two very valid points. 
this was a great way to uh, wrap up our conversation. It's been fascinating. It's been fun. Nicole and Mike, thank you so much for being on the podcast and for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. We hope, of course, we can do this sometime in the future again. And to all of you listening today, I hope you were able to take something away from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode as well as all the other resources you can find on our website. 